Once the sun appears, the colors of dawn start to shimmer with white. The sunlight cuts through the darkness, sending its rays to illuminate the land of Morocco. Out of these nights and days emerge travelers from afar, heading north to nest. Carried by the Simum, Shergi, and Elysee winds from the southwest, the white stork flies from Africa to Europe. On their long route, some make a halt in Rabat, capital of the Kingdom of Morocco. This wading bird has chosen an exceptional spot to nest. On the site of some ancient ruins, the Marinid civilization built a mysterious necropolis here. High walls ring this 13th century city of the dead of which now remains only the Kubas, these white tombs where the saints lie and the ruins of the city. In the Shela fortress, the storks nest in peace. It's a fairly quiet site, which is why it plays host to this extraordinary population of white storks, who find it a perfect spot to make their nests. There are the many ruins, there are also trees and many sites on the rocks. I think this has been going on for a long time because there are some old images that date back to the 1920s in which you can see white stork couples nesting at the site. The ancient site of Chela attracts historians as well as ornithologists like Imad, who watches over this gentle bird that features in many beliefs and tales. There are many fables and legends surrounding these creatures, especially the white stork. It's to do with the way of standing. It's a bipedal bird, which stands upright. And given its size, and from a distance, one might think it's a man wearing a white jellaba. Storks clack their beaks at the end of their mating display, while school children take history and natural science classes outdoors. The white storks seem to like the Chela Fortress, this garden with its magical atmosphere, so much that they've decided to move in permanently at the risk of abandoning their migratory habits. We've seen the stork for practically two decades now. It's tending to become a sedentary bird in Morocco, especially in the plains. Having said that, in the mountainous regions, it still retains its migratory behavior. As scientists, we follow the populations and the population trends among white storks because this tells us a great deal about the state of health of the environment. Storks, like all migratory birds, are a key indicator of climate change. 
revealing the quality of natural environments in terms of available food, peacefulness and water resources. Chela, which is a protected site, is welcoming increasing numbers of white storks, which underlines the quality of this environment. Perched on the side of the Jebel Dursa mountain, the white expanse of Tetuan stretches out in the sun of northern Morocco. In the first half of the 20th century, this city was the capital of the Spanish protectorate. Its architecture and music bear testimony to a far older Andalusian legacy. Violin, lute and percussion, the musicians wear white, a sign of prestige and pomp. Tetuan is famed for its Medina. Townsfolk in white jalabas pass down its narrow streets. It's Friday, the most important day of prayer in the week. A symbol of purity, the white jalaba made of wool or light fabric is part of a long tradition. The center and south of Morocco remains profoundly rural and that is where the wool is worked. In the foothills of the Middle Atlas, the most prestigious and most sought-after white wool jalabas in the kingdom are made. Here, in the rural town of Bzu, is where the best cloth is to be found. Every Friday in the souk, rolls of fabric are sold at auction. The weavers give their cloth to a crier who acts as auctioneer. The stakes are high. The fine pieces of material fetch a high price because they require a great deal of labor. Fatima Zara equitably redistributes the proceeds of the sale to the women in her fabric cooperative. Fatima has set up the cooperative's workshop in her garden. For us, white symbolizes the sacred. It's the color of decorum. Making a bazooya jalaba is an artisanal practice done by hand by the women of Bazoo. My mother learned this technique from her grandmother, who learned it from her mother. It's an ancient skill which is handed down from generation to generation. <laughs> In Morocco, the white jalaba from Bazou is worn by the king, members of parliament and other dignitaries. The cloth is entirely made by hand, a long traditional task which takes a single woman around six months. Making a bazouya jalaba involves several stages and it requires a great deal of time. 
Compared to other jalabas, these ones are fashioned with great care. It takes patience and precision because there are many stages and details to respect. Then the jalaba is given to the dressmaker, and here's the result. The vast empty beaches of the Atlantic coast to the south give way to the urbanism of modern Morocco to the north. Once, Spanish sailors used to identify a small fishing port on this coast thanks to a white house perched on a hill, La Casa Blanca. Several centuries later, the white house on the hill has become a white megalopolis, Casablanca, the economic capital of Morocco. Casablanca is home to Mohammed, a taxi driver with a passion for architecture. Here is our city of Casablanca. What I like about the city is its climate. It's very pleasant. The summers are hot and the winters are cold. I like this climate. My mother was born here and so was I. You see this neighborhood? The French built it when they arrived in Casablanca. The buildings, the hotels, they built it all. There are some architectural wonders, and despite their age, they are still standing. Starting in 1912, the city's booming economy under the protectorate led the French to create a new town with a business district and residential buildings all from scratch. A new generation of architects from the fine art school in Paris innovated with elements of Art Nouveau, neoclassicism and Art Deco. Casablanca is today an open-air school where young Moroccan architects like Labib study this heritage which blends European and Moroccan cultures. This building is the Asayag building. It was built in 1930 by Marius Boyer. It really stands out against the sky. The vertical aspect was the project's fundamental idea. In other words, to send Casablanca soaring. They wanted to build high, and this is one of the first really tall buildings. The people of Casablanca today say that these are European buildings, that they don't belong to them. Today, the message is to say no, there are things which are very much inspired by Moroccan culture. You see that much more on Boulevard Mohamed V, where they used zelig, mosaics and ceramics, and genuine Moroccan craftsmanship, so that speaks more to the Moroccan people. Auguste Perret, Marius Boyer, Edmond Briand. These French architects strive to experiment with the latest discoveries in housing materials and comfort. They also benefited from the know-how of traditional Moroccan skills, taking inspiration from current international trends in architecture and using innovative technologies like reinforced concrete. Casablanca was then the laboratory of architectural modernity for a whole era. All these buildings are the legacy of the period of the French protectorate. The architecture of certain buildings is amazing. Now this is a part of the Moroccan national heritage. A 
Casablanca is my home. I love the city's charm and I could never leave here. In less than a century, the White City went from a population of 20,000 to almost 4 million, becoming the biggest city in the Maghreb and one of the largest urban areas in Africa. Passing over the high atlas to the Great South, one comes to the lowlands, a region without water made up of rock, then dust and sand. The white light which illuminates this territory continues to erode what is left of the earth. This is the start of the immense Sahara Desert. Among the dune formations, dromedaries indicate the presence of man. At the gateway to the desert, they have erected bivouacs to form a village which attracts people from all around the world who want a first-hand taste of the great African desert. I'm scouting for a place to camp for some people who are going trekking and I have to take the GPS coordinates of the location of this bivouac. Abdu walks for hours to find the ideal spot in a landscape which forever seems the same wherever one looks. He works for a tour operator which organizes trips into the desert. There are quite a few tour operators who do this kind of thing in Morocco, so there's really quite stiff competition. That's why we have to continually create new itineraries to avoid running into other groups. The choice of this spot here will allow us to keep away from the main tracks so that our clients can camp in peace and quiet. Without being exactly busy, the Sahara nonetheless attracts many tourists in search of an intensely silent escapade. In this sandscape in the middle of nowhere, Abdu has set up a camp of around 15 tents with all Western comforts. For this kind of tourism, the essential experience is a dromedary back ride in the desert. This is how certain men of the desert now make a living in tourism, while at the same time providing economic benefits for their community through their activity. Heading west, the proximity of the ocean means this former seabed, with its lunar appearance, has not yet been reduced to sand. Here, patchy natural vegetation provides sustenance for a few herds of dromedary. In the Moroccan Sahara, a purely nomadic lifestyle subsists, inherited from ancestors. Mouloud lives this way. 
He is a breeder of dromedaries and lives here with his mother and sister. The daily search for pasture is their main preoccupation. Our previous camp was much further west. We left there to follow the rains. And we've been here for more than a year. We follow the rain and look for food for our livestock. We roam this land, we are nomads. When we see a big cloud in the sky, we break camp and we follow it to find water. And we settle wherever the grass is growing and there is grazing for our animals. Right to the west, the desert finally meets the ocean. This is how the local men fish, from the cliff tops on the edge of these great isolated spaces, rich in natural life. Going from Dakla to the north, the people of the sea become much more intrepid. The white limestone cliffs act as natural platforms for casting out lines. While many practice this kind of fishing for fun, to the south of Tantan, the professional fishermen are forced to take greater risks. Fishing is Paul's passion. Born in Morocco and owner of a fishing centre, he often brings his clients to the cliffs to try and catch the famous meagre, a highly prized fish. The limestone cliffs to the north of the small town of Achfinia see fishermen out with their rods from morning till evening. There are some cliffs where I go fishing from a height of 80 or 100 feet. There are places where you can fish from 50 feet, but in general you're very high up. That's Amiga. When you get a bite, you've got the fish, but you can't just bring it up like that. We've got a special net. It's a basket which opens in two. You put the line in the middle and you slide it along in parallel with another line. And once you get to the fish, you raise the head up and slide the basket over the catch. That means the meager ends up with its tail in the air and can't fall. At the end of the day, the light fades as the sun dips below the horizon. The white is no more than a paleness. Night takes over. <laughs> 